What makes comic book movies great? Another question that depends on who you ask. To me, my favorite comic book movies are the ones that embrace being a comic book. We've seen a really big pivot in this over the last couple of years. I think Nolan was the one who kind of changed the game with this, with Batman Begins. Because we then approached superhero movies as being grounded in the real world. And as much as I enjoyed Nolan's views on that and his style and what he's done with the characters, he's almost set up this, <laughs> this stage for many comic book movies to fail because we want them almost to be grounded in reality now. And again, going back to my childhood and growing up as a kid of the 80s, I grew up with Adam West Batman, which is like so silly and over the top. And then you had, of course, Christopher Reeves with Superman, Tim Burton with Batman and Batman Returns. And they all had this very much like different world. I was escaping to a different world. And then Nolan came in and he was like, no, it could be grounded in reality. And then we've seen this even with Joker. We've seen it with the new Matt Reeves Batman, where it's very grounded. And then on the other end of the spectrum, you got kind of the Marvel, Marvel Cinematic Universe that they've been trying to tie in real world issues into this comic book space. But I, I know I sound like I'm beating a dead horse here, but it all comes back down to story and characters. If a character is well-developed, whether it's a comic book, movie, or any type of movie, you're gonna find an audience. You're gonna connect, people are gonna connect, right? People like Tony Stark because he's a cool character, but he's also a well-developed character. Robert Downey Jr. really made that character his own. And while a lot of people say that a lot of Tony Stark is just Robert Downey Jr., that's the way the character was written. It was written for him. So you're just, you may be just watching him, but you've grown to like him and the stories help elevate him. And that's what's great about it. So to me, you, you, you can have all these characters. It's what you do with their progression. How the movie starts, where it goes in the middle and how it ends is whether it's going to be a good comic book movie or not. Is it gonna leave you wanting more? Are you gonna to wanna to see more of this character? Because we all know, and unfortunately nowadays, one movie is never enough. One movie is never enough. So as much as I like Joker, and I was hoping that Joker was gonna be a one-off, there's a Joker 2 coming, and it's gonna be a musical, and all these people are gonna be in it. Yeah, I, I'm curious to see it, don't get me wrong, but the reason why people like that movie and why people connected with that movie is that, again, they liked what Joaquin Phoenix brought to the table. They liked that character. They liked the way that it was written. What, what he was able to do with that material. So everything else, sure, the visual style, everyone loved about it, you know, everyone referencing, oh, Martin Scorsese look and all this stuff. But if you take Joaquin Phoenix out of that, does the movie, like what would that movie be with another actor? And that's, that's what you really, you really gotta focus on is that character. And who's, I guess also I should say, whose cast is that character, right? Because do those people, become the character that you want them to be. You get lost in Joaquin Phoenix's Joker, right? We get that, we like that. Iron Man, we know it's Robert Downey Jr. And a lot of these movies with so many characters nowadays, Eternals, I, I, I don't mean to keep crapping on this movie, but like to me, you have too many actors, no character develop, development, no story, like where is this going? I have no idea. I walked away from that movie. If I never seen those characters again, I'd be completely fine. But you, you want to spend more time with characters and character development is so important, especially in superhero movies, because you know that they're gonna keep making them. 
So like if, a, if an actor is bad in a role and the story doesn't work, it, it, again, doesn't matter the production value, doesn't matter the costumes, doesn't matter the hair and makeup. It's, it's not gonna win people over. And that's what you're seeing right now, I think with the phases, this last phase of Marvel, is that you're seeing so many things get thrown at you. You're seeing, <laughs> you're seeing Sam Raimi's fingerprints all over Doctor Strange, but yet people are complaining like, oh, did this person not watch WandaVision? Because Elizabeth Olsen is weird in this movie. She doesn't seem to like realize what happened in WandaVision. And what is Benedict Cumberbatch doing here? He was so <laughs> different in this one compared to how he was in the other movies. And you watch in a weird way, even Thor, right? It's like, okay, like he's, he's out of shape. And now like all of a sudden, like he's back in shape and like a montage. <laughs> it's, I don't know. It, it, they're, they're losing the, the, the writing. It's becoming style over substance is what I've, what I've been seeing with Marvel Phase 4 is style over substance. There's so much style and they're trying to combine these two ideas. Like there's a Taika Waititi movie here and then there's the Marvel movie here. There's a Sam Raimi movie here and then there's the Marvel movie here. And you, you really need to believe in your director and your cast and your screenwriters to tell the story they want us to tell. I mean, this kind of takes me back to, you know, Zack Snyder, right? I mean, Zack Snyder's Justice League that came out on HBO Max after fan support for like, seems like almost a decade, but it was only like five years. <laughs> but the outpouring of support was because everyone who knew Zack Snyder knew that that movie that they put in theaters wasn't his vision. And they weren't happy about it. And that's why there was so much of a fight for it because these are beloved characters that people know that literally decades upon decades of comic books were written about. And yes, he didn't follow the formula that probably Warner Brothers wanted, but he wanted to tell his vision and they, they mess with his vision. And that's the thing about his movies that I respect him about. You can watch Man of Steel, you can watch Batman v Superman. You can watch this new Justice League, the complete four-hour cut of it. And you can hate it. It's completely fine. But at least you know it's the movie that he wanted to make. I think it's really bad for comic book movies nowadays when you feel like a director is being dictated what they're doing. They're not, they don't have creative control. They get partial creative control, and then it's almost like someone steps in and is like, no, 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 you gotta do this, 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 and this. As long as you do this, this, and this, you can keep going. And it just becomes a total mess. And I, 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 it's weird that I'm saying this because Marvel was so always the leg up on DC for like a long time there because they had a formula. And I'm not saying that movies, every movie needs a formula, but right now it's just like, it's so inconsistent. I, I, I walk out of a movie and I just kind of go, Oh, okay, like I'm like this. This was awesome. This was terrible. Like I really don't know. Like the last like two or three Marvel movies were like five out of tens for me because I'm like I like things so much about these, but I hate so much about these. So yeah, it's it's. I think it's changed so much over the years, you know. Because again, you go into the the time of the '80s and '90s where it was like campy, and it really sort of like really embrace what a comic book movie was and it wasn't worried about the reality and now we're kind of with the spectacle we're with the substance and i think it's really you know and this is no no criticism because i think nolan was great christopher nolan did such a great job of telling such a grounded story that you really felt like this could happen anywhere but in a weird way it almost like no one knew how to react to it because you only have one christopher nolan that's the thing with him as a filmmaker he has a very unique vision so he can tell a story. And I think a lot of people try to replicate that even with the spectacle and it can't match it because for him, what always came first was, yes, it's a big, big scale movie, but he always cared about the story. He always cared about the characters and he picked the right actors to play those characters. Yeah, and even a smaller comic book movie, uh, American Splendor. Yes. So Paul Giamatti as Harvey 
Pankar or oh my god yeah yeah I mean he he in, from from when when you saw a little bit you heard some of his voice and different things and and you can go back to old Letterman uh, interviews and and you felt like that was him he he really like embodied this guy this this guy that was in this tough spot that felt trapped in his life and and felt like he wasn't going to be able to do anything but be this file clerk yeah oh, that's a great movie by the way that was that was another one that I saw very early on uh, and I I just love that that film. I mean, Paul Giamatti, <laughs> speaking of comic book movies, remember when he was in that Spider-Man movie and so underused and never used again? Yeah, it's very bizarre. But yeah, Paul, Paul Giamatti is still one of the greatest actors working in the day. Sure, so it sounds like, for lack of a better term, if an actor's actor is, is the main character, is this superhero or, or whatever, anti-hero, whatever, then, then it works. But if it's too surface of a performance, it's not going to work. Yeah, I mean, that's that's... That really is a great point and a, and a great way of looking at things. It's like, does the actor fit the role? Like, do they encompass what this character is? You know, and that's why, I mean, there's always been this debate about Batman, right? But like, to me, Michael Keaton will always be the best Batman because I literally just felt like he brought himself to the performance. Just like you can never tell me that Robert Downey Jr. wasn't like the perfect Iron Man. There's just certain actors that become these characters, and I know that they have these different versions of them. The only one that's really weird that like every actor who's kind of taken on besides Jared Leto um, is Joker. Like Joker, for some reason, whoever takes on that character brings something unique to it. You know, I mean, even going back to Cesar Romano, right? From like, I mean, the cheesiness and the overtop clowniness of that. He was great as that character. And then you got Jack Nicholson in the role. You got Heath Ledger. And I'm going to skip over Jared Leto and go right to Joaquin Phoenix. Like every one of those were like so uniquely different. And I think with Batman, right, it's, it's kind of like the mystery of like it. But like only Michael Keaton was able to balance the Bruce Wayne and the Batman. Where like you watch Robert Pattinson as Batman, and he's he's good at Batman. Bruce Wayne, yeah, you know. And I, I, we don't have to talk about George Clooney. He's another one we can, we can just go you know glance over. You know, Val Kilmer was probably you know again that was more again coming back to the script. Like that was a, not a great script that he had to work with, but you know he tried. And then Christian Bale, I feel like again great Bruce Wayne, the Batman. He never got the voice down. Christian Bale, as great of an actor as he is, I just felt like he never got that that voice down. And which is why he's always being made fun of, like, I'm Batman. You know, like everyone always like jokes about that because he just he wasn't able to fully get it. So that's why I always say that Michael Keaton is 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 top dog for Batman. How about Margot Kidder, Lois Lane? Did she embody Lois Lane? Yeah, I, yeah, I think so. I mean, and that's the, the the big disconnect, right? With a lot of people had with, um, oh my God, Amy Adams with Lois Lane, right? Like, she didn't really become the character. She didn't really get enough depth and enough story. She just kind of like was underdeveloped. A, a character that is so iconic and so well known and loved. And how many Superman? TV shows have there been and like all this thing, Superman and Lois, Lois and Clark, like all this stuff. There's been all these stories and that that character really deserves to have someone really do them justice on the big screen. Because I don't know, you're right, since going back to the original Superman, I don't know if anyone is, has ever played that character well. That's interesting because everything Amy Adams does otherwise, I haven't seen that performance, so I okay. can't speak to it. But I love her and everything yeah. else that she does, so I don't know. I'll have to actually watch it and see. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, mm -hmm. it's not that she's bad in it. It's just that it's a character that's not written well. Hmm. I mean, it's it's almost like going into the superhero conversation. It's it's almost like Wonder Woman, Wonder Woman, nineteen eighty four. Wonder Woman and Zack Snyder's Justice League, okay? So Wonder Woman as a movie up until the last act is, is badass. Like, I don't, I don't know. I mean, Gal Gadot in that performance is just so great. She embodies the role. She becomes that character. 
And she inspired so many, you know, young girls. I mean, I just remember that press day coming out and like how many people, you know, little girls and women were like so empowered by her performance. And then you you see her in Zack Snyder's Justice League and she's 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 again, she's she's that way. And then I don't know what happened in 1984. Like I'm not someone who hates that movie. I know a lot of people hate that movie. But she's like she's there and the rest of the movie's failing her. She's like doing her her best to make this stuff work, but she's got Pedro Pascal like hamming it up up to thir- like a 90. I don't know what he's doing in that movie. <laughs> There's like this weird rock storyline. And then, you know, let alone when the critics got all all over it with there's like subjective rape or some stuff with rape going on in the movie, which like I didn't even like bother paying attention to. But like she did. She became, you know, because of that, you know, and I I credit Zack Snyder for that because Zack Snyder took the chance. Patty, you know, Patty Jenkins put her in the, the first movie that really got her to shine. But Zack Snyder hired her. He's the one who saw the potential and, and, and made her the character. And then Patty Jenkins pushed her to the next level. And then in a weird way, kind of pushed her, <laughs> threw her down the stairs in the next movie. So uh, I, I don't know. And I, again, I don't hate 1984. I just think it's a missed opportunity. But I, I felt so, I was thinking about that movie and I feel so bad for, for Gal Gadot because she's sitting there And she's trying so hard (laughs) at the end of that movie. And she's really pouring her heart and soul into that performance. And she's really great in it. But it's just like that script. That script is not good. It's not good. 